Okay. Well, let's do Talking Tax with Tom then <laughs> at 1 o'clock on a given Wednesday. Hi, Tom. Hi, Jay. <laughs> Thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> That's Tom Yamachika. He's the president of Tax Foundation of Hawaii. We're here to talk about tax. Why this is a good moment to talk about tax? Because David Ige has uh, executed his vetoes. Uh, he had a list of 20, and he executed 18 of them. He's vetoed 18 bills. And we're going to talk about, you know, not only the process, but exactly what happened. I want to talk about, in terms of tax, the implications of what happened on his vetoes uh, of the tax bills. So the first thing we should understand is, where are we in the continuum? The legislature passes bills. It tells the governor what bills it's passed. He has a certain number of days, weeks, to make a list of the bills he is inclined or thinking about, um, about vetoing. vetoing. Yeah. Um, and then the only way he can veto a bill is if it is on that list. If it is not on that list, he cannot veto it. That, that's correct. And, and that's designed to give the legislature notice of what he's planning to veto so they can figure out whether they're going to call an override session or yeah. not. Override meaning uh, if the governor vetoes a bill and both houses uh, vote uh, in two-thirds in favor of the, uh, of the bill, then the bill becomes law anyway, and that's called a veto override. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the de facto is uh, that the decision to have a session to override, it's a special session, costs millions to do the special session, and that decision is made by the leadership of the House and the Senate, right? They, they, the two, two people, they decide whether they uh, are going to call a special session, right? Yeah, although um, they do have meetings internally within the chamber and I guess get people's uh, uh, take on what they're inclined to, to override and what they're not. And if they don't have the votes, I mean, you know, at least they can count. Right? So yes. if they don't have the votes uh, to, to, to do the two-thirds thing, uh, then, you know, why, uh, why call this yeah, a special yeah, yeah. session? Uh, or why call the override I suppose session? you have an interesting situation where they did have the votes, but they decided not to call the over, not to call the special. That would be interesting. I think that would result in, in the... Uh, a, front, a front line, uh, fr uh, head, a headline. <laughs> well, that, that and probably change in leadership. <laughs> Maybe so. Yeah. So... Uh, but at, they've, at, they've already indicated that they're not going to have a special session. That's right. No veto of the 18 vetoes that he issued um, is, is worth their while to have a special session override. And I guess... They, they fielded it and found that there wasn't sufficient votes to override a veto in any of those 18 vetoes, so it's not going to be a special session. Right. So uh, basically, our legislative session for 2019 is not POW. Okay. Uh, we know what's, what's going to become law, and we know what's not going to become law. Uh, of the four, uh, of, of the bills on the 20, uh, four of them involved tax or public finance, uh, th th those are the ones we were following. Um, of the four, three of them were actually vetoed. Uh, just that's kind of a microcosm of the, uh, out of 20, 18 got actually vetoed, and, and, and two were spared the act. Okay, what were the three that were actually vetoed? Okay, so we, um, we talked uh, sometime about the uh, Real Estate Investment Trust bill, uh, sometimes known as REITs. Uh, the problem there, uh, just to kind of give your uh, give your people a refresher, uh, is that there are uh, federally privileged entities called REITs. Uh, they have lots of shareholders, and they invest in real estate. And the uh, sh the federal taxation scheme basically says, okay, we're not going to tax the corporation, but we're going to tax the shareholders instead. Okay, uh, as applied to states like ours. Uh, it, leads, it leads to some problems because uh, the REITs do business here. Uh, they don't get subject to income tax. The shareholders are not here, so we can't tax them either, so we, we kind of lose out on the income tax. However, uh, the REITs do pay other kinds of taxes like the GET and real property tax. Just wondering, if, um, if I am a resident of the state of Washington, for example, where my recollection is, is there, no, there is no income tax in the state of Washington. So under existing law, as now confirmed by David Ige, and, you know, by vetoing the REIT bill, the REIT, uh, and for that matter, its non-resident owners, 
uh, including this guy we're talking about in the state of Washington. They don't pay any Hawaii tax. That's income correct. Income tax. And now he gets, he gets a, a distribution and a, a, amounts to a dividend check in the state of Washington. That's income tax. That's subject to income tax, generally speaking. But since there is no income tax in Washington, he doesn't pay income tax there either. That's right? correct. That's really interesting. So, okay, so the arguments that were flying back and forth, I mean, I heard ads, I heard ads, I don't know if you heard ads on the radio, television already, uh, about why we should and shouldn't do this. Actually, most of the ads I heard were by capital concentrations that did not want to see the, the bill uh, pass and that wanted to see it vetoed. Right, and, and uh, they, along with the governor's message, raised the possibility that, oh, uh, if this bill is enacted, uh, you know, in, investment in Hawaii will be disincentivized. There will be in, you know, investors kind of you know, heading for the exits. Uh, capital will dry up. Uh, you know, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, housing. In the I economy. heard the argument made about housing. We need housing with desperate need for housing, including especially, of course, affordable housing. And REIT money you know, pays for, is, is the investment capital. Uh, for a lot of housing in the state of Hawaii. Um, so we're going to have a problem in raising funds if we pass this bill, if we, if we had passed this bill. Right. Raising funds for this critical need for housing and affordable housing, housing for the homeless. That's touching a nerve, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I think one common thread through you know, uh, most of those arguments was th th they were all speculative. I mean, I, I didn't hear... Uh, you know, a whole lot of, you know, I'm a REIT, I'm planning to invest in Hawaii, if, they'll, if this bill passes, I will not come to Hawaii. Or I will take my, you know, I will take my Hawaii investments and I will pack up and leave. I didn't hear any of that. Did you? No. No, you're right, it was speculative. So, so, so a lot of it uh, was speculative, which, which kind of bothered me. Yeah. Uh, because like even when, um, the, uh, you know, the Amazon click-through nexus bill was being considered by the Lingle administration you know, some years ago. Uh, they you know, Amazon did come out and say, look, if you pass this bill, we are going to cancel all of, all of our distribution agreements with Hawaii people, uh, and we will go home. And that's what led Governor Lingle to veto the bill uh, at that time. Yeah. Well, um, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And, and by the same token, by the way, I, um, I, I, never, I never was straight on exactly how much money uh, it would have uh, raised for the state had the bill not been vetoed. I right, heard the, it, the, a few million dollars. I heard up to 60 million. But how many do you know? Uh, there were varying estimates. Um, a lot depends on the assumptions that you make. Uh, but the estimates ran between... Uh, you know, for four to five million in the first year to, you know, 30 to 60 million. Uh, again, you know, depending on who, whose money and, and whose um, uh, statistics you believe. Yeah. Well, I think everybody was being careful. I mean, the, both the constituents, the advocates for and, and against, uh, were being careful. I mean, you don't, you don't want to say how much money you think it'll, uh, it'll realize for the state because you could be completely wrong and embarrassed later. Likewise, uh, you don't want to say that you're not going to invest anymore in Hawaii because you may invest anyway, even if the REIT bill, you know, it doesn't cost the REIT anything. Think about that. It costs the individual REIT owners on the mainland. That's who is actually going to pay the cost of a bill like this. That's right. In the end of the day, it's all a pass through anyway, like a limited partnership. Yeah, it, it all gets passed, passed yeah. on in the end. Yeah. Yeah. So any. Any taxes are imposed at the entity level, they have to be you know, absorbed somewhere. Yeah. And the other thing that strikes me is let's, let's take a state other than Washington. Let's take New York, where the income tax is really steep. Okay? Um, if, the, if the bill had passed, um, the individual uh, would have received, the individual owner would have received less money from the REIT. Right. Because the REIT would have had to pay taxes, and that would reduce his share of the, of the net. Right. Um, so it, it doesn't mean he has to pay twice. He has to pay the New York income tax on whatever he gets. But he, what he gets is less 
because Hawaii imposes a tax in that circumstance. That's right. So, so it's not like unfair on, to him or anything. It would be taxed on a, letter, on a lesser amount. Yeah. The only time it would be unfair, or at least have an effect, would be like in the case of the state of Washington, where he would not be paying Washington income tax. Yeah, or, or if, if the uh, shareholder is a tax-exempt organization, like a pension fund, or a, so a sovereign provident fund, or something like that, right. uh, they, they don't pay tax at the shareholder level on dividends anyway, right. either federal or state. Right. right. Yeah, well, I mean, and that's true, and they would, they would suffer. Um, and you, you can't argue with that. They would suffer. Yeah. Because of, on the other hand, Hawaii needs to have revenue like that. And, and from a tax policy point of view, this, you know, if the governor had not vetoed it, it would have been okay for tax policy, right? Well, let's, let's kind of go with that point just for a second. Now, um, this bill and, and the next one I'm going to talk about, which we call the Airbnb bill, uh, they were primarily advanced because the legislature thought, hey, we need money for programs and services. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, whatever uh, those two bills were going to produce, they ain't getting it now. So uh, the governor was asked, well, how are you going to compensate for this? And he, and, he, and, and, and he said, you know, when he made a press conference at the time he announced the intent to veto this, he said, well, we're going to have to, uh, you know, apply restrictions on state government. Uh, which he has the authority to do. Okay. I mean, a certain amount of budget goes to an agency, and he can tell the agency, you, know, you spend 10% less. Yeah, that's always hard. You go to an agency and say, slice your budget 10%, and um, the agency says, what 10%? What programs do you want us to drop? And the state says, you figure it out. You just drop 10%, that's all you do. This is very hard, and sometimes... When this happens, the agency makes a mistake and drops the wrong programs. Uh, but the budget does get reduced when that happens. I'm not sure if that's a good way you know, to grow or to evolve or to shrink state government. Uh, it, needs, it needs more nuance to say what programs survive and what programs don't. Yeah, I mean, for, for a number of years, um, that's what the EGA administration had been doing. Uh, the administration, they, too. Yeah, yeah, but I think more in the EGA administration. Because the, the restrictions were, I think, 10% as opposed to Lingle's 5%. Uh, agencies had to, had to cut back on, their, uh, on everything they did quite a bit. And, and there are a lot of costs that are hard to avoid, like people, right? You have, you have warm bodies, you can't really fire them, right? Because uh, otherwise the unions would get upset, right? God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, so... Uh, uh, so cutting the amount you pay for salaries, benefits, and so forth uh, is, is difficult, so you have to cut somewhere else. It's true. You're right. So, so, you, 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 so you roll back maintenance, you roll back um, uh, you know, purchase of equipment. Uh, new projects, new construction, all that. Yeah. So, so you're really holding back in sort of a progressive development of the state, and you're left with a, a kind of boiled down uh, uh, workforce. That is the most expensive part of the program because not only do they get paid, and sometimes well, but they get all these retirement benefits, which are you know, remarkable and better than many other states. Right. Now, I mean, to, uh, to be fair, uh, the, the individual agencies don't... Um, uh, it, it, I mean, the, the, the retirement part is not in their budget. It's, it's in budget and finance, but, uh, but they have to deal with the personnel portion. Yeah. Well, you know, well, you know I mean, it's nice that they say that. And it's nice that, you know, Lingle said 5% and David Ige says 10 But at the end of the day, it puts stress on the taxpayer. Because to the extent that we don't have money, um, then we, we're always going to be looking at raising taxes in order to cover the shortfall. Yeah, or, or providing, you know, less in terms of product services, you know, when, when, the, when you need help from the state, is somebody going to be around? Right. Maybe not. Right. And, and what makes this uh, you know, excruciating is that we are facing climate change and other, and other unliquidated liabilities of you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 billion dollars. We don't have the money. And we won't have the money. And uh, that, you know, that's really problematic. 
Climate change is going to cost billions. What are we going to do in duress? What are we going to do after that big storm that's coming anytime? We will not have the money. And then there'll be, you know, the economy be busted over, over uh, the decline in tourism. Uh, we will we'll be in bad shape that way. Well, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, are, are, are too worried to see even that far out. Um, I mean, they're worried about, can they, can they make the rent payment next week? And a lot of a lot of people can. Yeah, touche. Gives me a headache. Whenever I have a headache like that, I I need to take a break. Tom, can we take a break together? We're gonna to take a headache break. We'll be right back in one minute. Tom Yamachika and me talking about tax. Aloha. My name is Mark Schlav. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, a host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. Oh, that was like a good Excedrin number nine. Very good. We're back. Tom Yamachika and me doing tax here and talking about David Ige's uh, veto. So you mentioned there were four of them. Um, we covered um, the REITs. Uh, you mentioned uh, B&B, the B&B &B bill. We're going to talk about that right now. And then we're going to talk about, um, was it the, uh, uh, the, movie, the credit? movie tax credits? You talk about that. And then the vape bill. Well, last yeah, week, yeah, e-cigarettes. Speed through all of that. So Airbnb, um, I think it's complicated. You think it's not so complicated. Yeah, I mean, the, what, what the bill uh, is, is trying to do is, you know, we have people who for whatever reason, uh, rent out, the, you know, either part of their houses or their, their entire home or their entire apartment or whatever it is, uh, to transients so they can, you know, earn some money to... Uh, pay the mortgage. Pay the mortgage. Um, or, or, you know, whatever else they need money for. Uh, and the only thing that the Airbnb bill was supposed to do was to say, okay, platforms, you can register to collect and remit tax. What that means is your, the owners have to pay GET. They have to pay the transient accommodations tax. If like a hotel. Like the hotel. Um, a lot of them don't. And to, to prevent the leakage, uh, the platform said, okay, you know, let us register and collect the tax for you. Why did they do that? Was that uh, being nice or what? Uh, that's one theory. Uh, another theory is they wanted to, you know, they have another agenda. Um, not sure what that was, but they wanted to protect their homeowners. Now, uh, the, the, the one thing that the bill did not address was that a lot of these, these B&Bs are illegal in, uh, at the county level because there are county zoning laws that say, you can't do this kind of business here in this residential neighborhood. There's serious penalties, too. Well, yeah, they got more, and they got a lot more serious. Uh, Maui uh, and um, Honolulu now have penalties up to $10,000 a day, okay? Uh, which is kind of not what, happened, not what the state of affairs it's, it's, was before, but that's what it is now. comes to mind. Definitely. Now, uh, so the state um, in this particular bill, okay, wasn't going to share information with the county. They don't have to. I mean, what, what makes them have to share information with the county? 
Okay. And 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 my sounds like a wink and a blink thing, doesn't it? You go after yours, I go after mine, and if the twain don't meet, it doesn't matter. Yeah, because you know, actually the states have the, the state and the, and the counties have, have competing interests. Okay, the, the state's interest is if business was done, we, we, we have to tax it. Okay, like Al Capone, we don't care if the, the business was legal or not. Business was done, we get to tax it. Okay, counties are saying, oh, but this uh, uh, but this is illegal, and we got to enforce it. You know, never mind that they weren't enforcing it at any, any time prior, okay, uh, but they want to enforce it now. So, uh, I mean, I can see the homeowner walking into the $10,000 a day hearing and saying, I paid the tax. Actually, Airbnb paid the tax for me. Um, you know, I'm a good boy. I, I did the right thing. And the zoning is unreasonable. And I need the money for my mortgage. Otherwise, I'm going to be foreclosed. Well, that's, that's what, where you have the conflict because you have two different governments. They say two different things. They're not consistent, and they don't have to be. They don't have to be, but wouldn't it be a better world if they were? It would, yeah. <laughs> okay, anyway, so that's the part where my head begins to spin. Not to the point where I want to take another break, but my head spins when you have two jurisdictions. This is like the highways. You have state jurisdiction on the, some highways and county jurisdiction on the other, and, and, and nobody knows which highway is what and all that, you know. And, and they don't necessarily coordinate their efforts. That's right. So, okay, so what, is, what does it mean? He, he vetoed the bill. He vetoed the bill, now, so... Now there's no platform going to collect it, uh, and that each homeowner is on his own, right? To pay yeah. the tax or not pay the tax. Right, so it, it doesn't change the underlying law. If you, you know, if, if, you, if you do a transient vacation rental, you're liable for the tax. You've got to pay it. Okay, if you haven't been, you know, you, you, better, you better make peace with the state because yeah. you, you're, you're liable for these taxes. It's, it's a Sophie's choice. You know what is something like the census question that's pending at the federal level. Do I, I'm the homeowner, right? Do I pay the tax? Because if I pay the tax, maybe one of these days they're going to compare notes, and then I'm going to get nailed on the zoning. So if I don't pay the tax, nobody would be the better of it. And um, I think you're going to have a lot of scofflaws coming out of this deal. If we, don't, if we don't already have them. We already have them, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So this so, is going to encourage people not to pay, not to pay the, the gross excise tax. Maybe, um, but again, uh, the governor's objection to, to, to this bill was, hey, you know, if I sign this, it's going to legitimize uh, these transient vacation rentals in illegal places. Well, that may be de facto true. And maybe that is why Airbnb stepped up, you know, to say that it would, it would stand uh, as the tax collector. Um, because, uh, you know, my argument before is, well, the homeowner is doing the right thing, Airbnb is collecting, the state is getting its, its GET, why punish the homeowner in, in those circumstances? Um, well, and, and you, then you later punish the on, homeowner because uh, he or she is renting in, in a place where they're not supposed to. Right, but, but then Airbnb will be seeking changes in the zoning law. They'll, they'll never get it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, it's a county issue. It's a different jurisdiction. Yeah. It's a different legislative body. <laughs> Interesting. So is this a good thing? you have any thoughts? Um, the, the, I, I don't know about you know, the, the policies involved, but the one thing I do know uh, is that the reason why this bill was being pushed in the first place was that it was a revenue raiser, uh, that... That, that, that you do this kind of withholding scheme, you know, like, like it is for uh, every, everyday employees who come to work. The employer withholds and pays taxes, right? Because if you trust the employees to do, the, to do it themselves, they probably won't, mm -hmm. okay? So you have the withholding mechanism in place, uh, compliance is a lot better, and you get more money in the door. Mm -hmm. and, and this money in the door is not going to be happening now that the bill is vetoed. Yeah, and what's interesting is if you look at the money on both sides of the equation, we've been discussing. Uh, the gross, gross excise tax as collected by Airbnb, that's a substantial amount of money. And there's a fair guarantee that they would, you know, collect it and pay it over to the state. It's, it's big bucks. Uh, fining people $10,000 a, a day for uh, zoning violations, the counties don't have the resources to go after them. They're not going to do it. It's going to become a real, 
a real churn on every single fine that they levy. People are going to appeal that. It's going to take forever, and it's not a predictable cash flow at all. So what would you rather have if you were the government? I mean, the combined government, what would you rather have? Well, um, if, and, and I think this is you know, the point that was made in some recent editorials, you know, if you're going to have these zoning ordinances, right, you have to have the resources to enforce them. If you're not going to enforce them, why, you know, why, why do it? Good point. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of ordinances that, that deal with zoning and permitting and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, we have an infrastructure that is woefully inadequate to, to enforce them and deal with them. You know, uh, you know, humongous lines for permits come to mind, for example. Uh, inordinate delays in getting anything approved and built. Uh, that, that is a major problem. We don't have the infrastructure, we don't have the resources, and there's really no, nothing out there that suggests we will in the future either. Yeah, in, instead we're, 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 we're planning on spending all this money on other stuff, uh, you know, like uh, rail and the Blaisdell Center and, and whatever else have you. Uh, and I, I, I kind of shudder to think what's going to be in store for taxpayers, at least here in Honolulu. Yeah, well, that's like, it's like cutting the budget of the tax office. If you cut the budget of the tax office, you're going to get lower collections. If you get lower collections, you're, you're, you're kind of... Um, you're going to cut the budget even more. Yeah, you have less money to, you know, it's a spiral down. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next bill. Okay. Um, one bill out of the four that did become law was the movie credit bill. Now, what do I mean by the movie credit bill? We, we, we grant uh, credits to productions that come here, film, employ people here, uh, you know, that kind of thing. There's a you know, multi-step process to qualify. Uh, and where we had it was we had a statewide cap, which is like all the productions anywhere in the state, the maximum credit you can pay out is $35 million. Now, um, that might have been, been okay a few years ago, uh, but we now have like two uh, major TV series here, namely 5 0 and Magnum PI, right? And, and, and that frankly eats up most of the $35 million. So you want a uh, you know, feature film like Pirates of the Caribbean or Jumanji to come here. Uh, there, there's, there's no space left, mm. at least in the credit landscape. Yeah, well, let me, let me add a thought, and that is uh, uh, there's no space left for the Hawaii filmmaker either. Um, this is all Hollywood style. This is the big boys coming and, um, you know, making national or global films, but it, isn't, it really is, does not serve as an incentive um, for local filmmakers. And, you wonder well, for why local, our, for our, local our, filmmakers, the amounts usually are a lot smaller. So, yeah. so it's, it's easier to kind of like, you know. Are they getting anything? I think they are. Yeah. Well, that's good. You can, you, can, you can shoehorn them in easier well, I, than, I, than I a major production. I think the local production. film industry is not up to what it could be if they were really incentivized. Yeah. But, but, but I think, you know, the other reality you have to face is that a major production comes down here. They spend major amounts of money in, in our economy. Yeah, sure. It's just a coupon clip. We, you know, we're investing. It's an investment. Yes. And, 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 they, and they hire a lot of people, especially the unions, right? Um, and they, they, they throw money all over the place. Sometimes they throw more money around than they should. You know, they spend a lot of money on these big budget films. They do. And we get a lot of it here in Hawaii. So it's, it's a, it film, the film office, the film, uh, you know, the film incentives uh, for that. Uh, they're not necessarily to build great films. They're not necessarily to build a film industry. They're a matter of jobs. Right. And so what this bill does, and this is the one that, that governor allowed to become law, is it basically raises the $35 million cap to 50. 50. Mm -hmm. right. well, that's a substantial increase. Yeah. Hope, I mean, it's, it's, not what the, uh, it's, it's not what Hollywood wanted. Hollywood wanted the uh, cap to be removed entirely, but uh, that's not what legislators... Still, yeah. Yeah. You still have a, a limited pot. Yes. Um, yeah, and, I, and we can't spend any time on this, but um, they, they don't have a, an Act 221. They don't have a, a, tech, a tax credit, and that's really sad. 
Yeah, it used anymore. to be the two of them yeah. were joined at the hip, right? You remember right. the original 221 was a combination of, of film and uh, tech investment. Now it's film, but no tech investment. They, they have some tech investment uh, um, incentives, but they're you know, in different places. How do you say peanuts in French? <laughs> Never mind. Okay, the last one. Let's deal with the last one. The last one is uh, a bill that started off uh, imposing substantial tobacco taxes on e-cigarettes, uh, but it kind of got morphed in, at the last minute into a bill that says, okay, um, educators seeing uh, e-cigarettes in the classroom or, you know, related paraphernalia can, can confiscate them. Yeah, or are, are directed to confiscate. No tax, confiscation. Yeah, it's just confiscation. And what does that mean? You, you rip it out of his hands? You, are you entitled to use force? Uh, I, I'm not sure about the I'm, force I'm part. I'm sure but that I, no teacher would use force. On this. It's too risky. But, but what it does say is that, uh, that the student has to kind of, you know, uh, uh, cough up this e-cig and it's not theirs anymore. It's going to be, you know, the, the school takes possession of it and, and, this, and the student gets, doesn't get to see it anymore. Yeah. Oh, that's too bad. It would have been better if he allowed that to become law now. Well, I mean, there were um, kind of, a, you know, a number of sides to it. The, you know, the objection was that the law was vague and that it, doesn't, it didn't really define what, a, uh, what, a, what an e-cigarette was. Okay. So uh, I, I think the, um, the teachers were concerned that, uh, you know, if they, if they act, they'd be challenged. and and have to kind of go through the, the, the court system. It. Yeah, they, they did. And, and I'm sure that the, the vaping companies opposed it too. And at the end of the day, it's, it's who stands up, who, makes, who makes a, takes a position, who advocates. It has a lot to do. It's not like the governor sits alone in his office uh, without input from constituents. He hears from a lot of people in the process of deciding what to veto and, and so forth. And this is all of the bills we talked about. I'm sure he was surrounded with voices. Yeah, pressure on both sides. I mean, I, I kind of think of him as the balloon in the middle and everybody's pushing on it. Yeah, yeah we have pressure here too at ThinkTech. As, as we uh, pass our 30-minute mark, I get pressure in my ear from our engineer who, who pressures me <laughs> to close the show down. So, Tom, I'm afraid we're out of time. But thank you so much for coming down yet again. We really appreciate it. Talking tax with Tom. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Thank you for having me on the show. <laughs>